Welcome to the Hughes Hubbard Anti-Corruption and Internal Investigation Practice Group's podcast, All Things Investigations. The Hughes Hubbard Anti-Corruption and Internal Investigation Practices Group represents many of the premier companies around the world, providing advice on issues spanning the full anti-corruption and compliance spectrum. In this podcast, host Tom Fox and Members of the Hughes Hubbard Anti-Corruption and Internal Practice Group will highlight some of the key legal issues involved in white collar and other investigations, both domestically and internationally. We will tackle topical issues involved in investigations, as well as explore how companies can prevent and detect issues that arise in conducting investigations on a worldwide basis. Today, I visit with Yi Chen Ho, who is the head of HHR's China practice. We talk about the challenges of practicing law in China and for Chinese clients in the United States, as well as for U.S. clients doing business in China. I know you'll enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode of the award-winning All Things Investigation. Today, I'm absolutely thrilled to have with me Yi Chen Ho. Yi Chen, first of all, welcome, and thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. Thank you for having me, Tom. Could you tell us uh, your educational or rather academic and professional backgrounds? Sure, we'll do. I I guess relevant to the cross-border practice, I wanted to say I grew up 100% in the United States, although I speak, read, and write uh, fluent Mandarin Chinese only because I was forced to do so as a child. But I, I am cross-multicultural, bi, you know, trilingual, cross-cultural. I went to school here in the United States, went to uh, UC Berkeley with an English undergrad major then went uh, straight on to law school at UC Hastings. I think it's called UC College of the Law. <laughs> it's changed names a couple of times. And after graduation, I started my cross-border, building up a cross-border practice in the Los Angeles area and have been here ever since with very frequent travel to greater China. So what's your current role? My current role at uh, Hughes Hubbard is the co-chair of the China practice. I'm also chair of Asia Development, which is basically opening up uh, business development opportunities, looking into various parts of Asia to grow our practice and expertise. And what attracted you to Hughes Hubbard? Hughes has always been a, I I admire this firm from afar for, for quite a long time now. It's a smaller firm, but very nimble, extremely high caliber uh, lawyers practicing law in a very collegial environment. I got to know the lawyers a lot uh, better through the lateral interview process and realized that cultural fit is very important. I wanted to grow an existing China practice that was dynamic, that's nimble, and I saw the hunger and earnestness of this firm wanting to expand into China, greater China. They were interested in China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore. And that was exciting to me. Um, I I had been at large firms for a great majority of my career. And I wanted to go back to my roots of building up and expanding an existing almighty China practice with my contacts and aspirations for an even greater and better platform here. It's interesting. I don't know if it's you or me, but when you said large firm, I immediately assume Hughes Hubbard's a large firm just because of the white shoe nature of the practice, really the top notch practice that I'm aware of literally across the globe and the quality of the legal work done. But it's actually a fairly small law firm and a small now, but perhaps not small when you and I started, but you're a, it's not a huge mega firm. Would that be a fair characterization? You are absolutely right. I mean, Tom, at this point, large, you've got firms. I, I come from firm a firm of 3,500 plus lawyers. I've been at a firm with 36 international offices. Hughes is nimble. When I say that is, if you look at the number of offices that Hughes operates in, you'd be shocked because we are actually very global in nature. We're in litigating all across the United States in all sorts of state and federal courts. We do international arbitrations worldwide. We have very dynamic international practice. But when you look at our offices, you wouldn't know it. Hughes is a larger firm. It is not by any means a big law firm, as you had mentioned, because we've now have law firms that are conglomerates and through mergers that are so huge. It's even hard to fathom practicing at a firm of that caliber (laughs) and still managing to, to navigate through 
conflicts. But yeah, Hughes is a, I, I would consider it a very high caliber, more boutique style firm, especially since a lot of these lawyers have made their entire careers here. And I, I found that to be fascinating that they would stay here for two, three decades, starting out when they were associates or come back after a round of government work or in-house counsel, they still want to come back home. And to me, that signified a very collegial, smaller firm environment. Although they are not a small firm, we operate much like a family. We cross-sell. We do a lot of um, cross-office working. I work with colleagues in all offices, not just Los Angeles. I work in with colleagues in DC, New York, and internationally. So I, I think it makes it a very special place. So I practice in Houston for nearly 40 years, and China is actually a huge market in the Texas energy realm. When I was in-house, I traveled to China multiple times. Many people did on a routine basis. That was a long time ago, though. What's it like now for China practice or the practice of law for someone like yourself with a focus on China? It's very interesting as the geopolitical dynamics change and shift over time. And we've seen this, right, Tom? I mean, it started, I want to say, maybe a little bit pre-COVID, but definitely when COVID hit, that sort of triggered a lot of the sort of... Yeah. I would say more tensions across the borders, the US, China, even Taiwan, it all got kind of wrapped up into this geopolitical tension, but that's everywhere. If you think about it, it's US and Eastern Europe. I mean, that this is sort of the nature. It's very polarizing, but at the end of the day, is business still flowing between the countries? Are ca is capital still flowing between the countries? Are business deals being done? Is there M&A activity? Is there litigation? Is there international arbitration? Are there investigations? Is it business as usual? It may be different, but it doesn't mean that things have changed. I would posit that both countries need each other to grow and develop. Each have their own special, unique strengths, and we need to find a way to coexist. <laughs> In spite of the political tensions, I think with different administrations and their take on cross-border relations, it's made the practice, I think, even more dynamic and critical and I'm often called upon for more, I want to call it crisis management type of work, but reality is just helping their business run smoothly. How do we do that as an effective counselor and advisor? How can I make my clients uh, navigate through difficult, sticky investigations, litigation, a deal gone south? How do, we sal how do we salvage it? How can we make it such that both sides business, whether I'm representing a U.S. company with interest in China, whether I'm representing a Chinese company with a litigation issue in the United States, how can we unravel the dispute or investigation and help them along the way? I, I find that to be a more critical part of my role now as an advisor, even more important in this type of environment to think of creative solutions out-of-the-box business solutions, practical judgment reasons why we want to get out of litigation or settle matters or resolve in, f in favor of basically litigating a case or being embroiled in a dispute because that really doesn't help my clients advance their business interests. And at the end of the day, you want them to move along and do what they do best. And what we do best is to help them get out of sticky and difficult situations. So that really crystallizes something I've been thinking about for a long time, and let me see if I can set it up correctly. I come out of the anti-corruption world, and in what I saw in the energy capital of the world, Houston, which is coincidentally the FCPA capital of the world, simply because of energy, but I saw a business response to that legal push, and the business response was every company decided to have a compliance program, but equally more importantly, they said, if you want to do business with us, you have to have a compliance program. So they drove that all the way down the supply chain. And I saw a business response to a legal problem, which is bribery and corruption. What I heard you just articulate was a business response, not to a legal problem, but a political problem. And I don't want to sound Pollyannish to say it's just people to people. It's much more than that. It's access to capital. It's access to markets. It's a flow of capital. It's not one way. It's not to me that through the work you and others are doing in this arena, it actually might help diffuse tensions. And I know I've set that up as a big question, but is that something you see happening literally on the business to business level? 
It's funny, Tom, you talk about diffusing tensions. That's a great way to describe some of the things that I do right now for my clients. Oftentimes, I might even advise them if they were on the brink of a dispute, I would say, you know what, I'm going to hang back and help you see if we could keep the communication channel lines open longer than normal. For example, in a normal situation in the U.S., we probably would just already write a demand letter or respond with a, a lawyer communication. Instead, I said, you know what, why don't we have the business folks dialogue with each other as, as long and as, as much we could draw this out to see if there is a business solution around this. It is diffusing tensions. We're trying to make it such that China or Chinese companies have a, I think, unearned reputation of, oh, they're difficult, they're shady, they're not direct. It's actually quite the opposite. Oftentimes, it's just really a cultural gap. They don't know. How do I speak to the other side such that they can see the earnestness in my uh, desire to resolve this dispute? It's a matter of how you talk to each other. And at the end of the day, it's about communication. What do lawyers do effectively? They need to communicate. They can help their clients communicate in different ways. We could do it through litigation. We could also do it through back-end channels. I'll help you write and communicate what you want. I'm in a, a couple of matters right now where I have not surfaced. I've been in the background for, I want to say, six months now. They don't even know. They might know a lawyer is involved from the way that the discussions are set up. But I think there's something to be said about hanging back as the advisor, navigating the dispute, helping them see if there's a way around litigation, arbitration, or just full bore disputes. And if there's a way in which to unravel a unpack a situation such that you can reach a mutually amicable resolution, that would be my goal. To me, that's a win more, more so than any court. Do you see on a business to business basis that the people you would sit across the table from, not your not American clients, but Chinese understand that we really both need each other on a business basis. And it's not a massive selling of capital or transfer of capital from China to the U.S., but it's actually the U.S. selling back to China as well. It is absolutely a, I want to say like a symbiotic relationship. I believe on the business side of things, especially like the high level executives, they know this. Absolutely. There's the, there may be less traffic in that deals ha have to be diligenced a little bit more. People want to scrutinize regulatory issues a bit more, button up and dot your I's, cross your T's on certain deals. But at the end of the day, absolutely, we do need each other. Consumers rely on he heavily on China manufactured goods. China relies heavily on U.S. services and know-how and all those things. I mean, Absolutely. I think both countries need each other to grow. They recognize this. It's just there could be at any given moment in time, political tensions that might get in the way. And I'll use a great example. Taiwan and China. I'm actually from Taiwan. I'm not, I wasn't born in China. The way I speak Chinese, people immediately say, oh, you're from Taiwan. <laughs> I just, it's sort of like a, a British accent versus an uh, Southern Amer uh, American accent. You would know, oh, this person's from UK. So I initially thought, oh, Chinese will not, Chinese companies will not want to hire me because I'm from Taiwan and Chinese hate Taiwanese and so forth. That was absolutely not the case. One, they think I'm a U.S. trained Chinese American lawyer that can communicate with them effectively in Chinese, which is what I do best. So that's the first uh, misconception that's basically diffused. The second way that they view me is, that's great. You're from Taiwan. I'd love to do business in Taiwan. I don't know how to do it. How do I bridge the gap? We need each other. And for decades, that's been the way the Chinese and the Taiwanese have coexisted. They continue to invest in each other's countries, continue to get uh, ingrained in each other's uh, environments, whether it's with know-how, technology, capital investment, m and I see that because I know the Chinese and Taiwanese tensions and how they, the workarounds and how that all uh, un unraveled and unfolded, I see that happening on the US and China side. It's just a little bit later, but um, the same pattern. They end up figuring out a way to coexist and still get deals done and still allow the capital to flow because they need each other. The I love the mischaracterization that you're a uh, <laughs> uh, cultural Every American is accused of cultural stereotyping, and here you're being cultural stereotyped from the Chinese. Absolutely. The Chinese-American trained lawyer who could talk to us. 
That is, wow. Okay, let me, you've written over the years and practiced quite a bit in the area of cross-border investigation. So I have to take this opportunity to learn from you about cross-border investigations. So right now, what would you say are two or three of the key issues you would face in a cross-border investigation or an enforcement action or, or something where there's some sort of dynamic tension involved? I'll tell you this, in greater China, the very concept of discovery, let's just talk about it from a government standpoint, that they basically can ask you to produce anything that's relevant data, and you basically have to comply. In greater China, there's really kind of no such mechanism for discovery, producing of documents that actually might be adverse to your interests. That is a very foreign concept. There's no concept, there's no jury in, in Greater China. Typically, how this works is I have actually managed cases in China and Taiwan, and I've gone to court and I thought, oh my gosh, this is no wonder there's a culture shock because I feel a culture shock just being in their system where each side brings forth evidence that supports their claims only. So the strengths of their claims. If you were going to knock on the other side, you either have that evidence and you're going to bring it, or it doesn't exist at all. So we assume that throughout this process, the adversarial process, that bad documents would surface one way or the other, whether it's definitely not going to be from you, but if the other side, the opponent had it, they would have produced it already. And then there's no depositions. So the judge would summarize testimony according to how they distilled it. There's no Fifth Amendment, right, to remain silent. A judge could literally ask you, Mr. Executive, did you or did you not do X? And I remember sitting in the courtroom thinking, please don't answer that question. You have to answer the question. There's no get going around it. The different procedural rules, the different substantive rights that are afforded. Um, there's, it's just night and day. So when I tell a client, the Department of uh, Justice wants you to produce all of your sales uh, records and data for, for a 10-year span period of time, that is a great shock to them. Like, we're going to get into intrude into my business and allow me to have to divulge and disclose all this business proprietary information into the ether, um, sending it over to the United States. When I am a Taiwanese based company with zero presence in the United States because of the connection, because you do business in the United States, that makes it permissible for the DOJ to have that jurisdictional reach. That is a great culture shock. So I often have the most difficult conversations having to do with the discovery process in general. That's been always the greatest challenge. It's a huge culture shock to have to open your coffers and show a plaintiff or a class action plaintiff or your opponent sales data, your technology know-how. They don't trust protective orders and any other mechanisms that will protect the sanctity of their information to them that is of utmost secrecy that isn't afforded the protections uh, according to their views. I continue to find it challenging to navigate discovery hurdles with Chinese clients in, discover in, in litigation or investigations in general. One of the things I strove for as strongly as I could when I was negotiating contracts, particularly with mainland China companies, was a dispute forum of arbitration in Singapore. Is that, and my thought was that if I could get to a relatively neutral place, not focusing on the arbitrators themselves, but just the forum, that I could stand a fair chance that being in accord in mainland China is, one, is that a valid approach or response? And two, are Chinese companies open to a dispute resolution forum other than in the, their home country of China? That is a very valid response, a very uh, normal situation to want to find a neutral forum for a dispute resolution that is considered to be a sophisticated arbitral forum and venue with sophisticated uh, business rules and regulations. So yes, that continues to be advocated and negotiated, most times successfully. Although I will say that the Chinese arbitral entities have really wanted to display their neutrality, their professionalism, and that they can also issue <laughs> neutrally favorable awards. In other words, they're not going to always favor the Chinese entities. They need to do that to get to an international level of trust 
and a respect within the arbitral community. So I do see a trend that in, in the last several years, U.S. companies faring well under Chinese arbitral venues. So whether it's the Shanghai or the Beijing Arbitration Commission, using their arbitral rules and ha having the seat of the arbitration be in those jurisdictions have yielded awards that are favorable. And that's now kind of tipping the scale to say, look, we're also fair, neutral, and sophisticated. You should try us out. I know they're trying to up their level and up their game. So you probably see a lot more insistence on trying to use Chinese arbitral venues as the seat of arbitration. But yes, Singapore and other Asian venues continue to be, Hong Kong, HKIAC, continues to be the more favored and trusted arbitral seats. The business response that, I, that we visited about in this podcast of business to businesses talking, business to businesses working to resolve disputes, is that something that you see continuing, not just in the next near term of a year or two, but something that we can all perhaps work towards 2030 to, or even further to help move the ball forward and diffuse tensions, if any? Tom, I feel that if tensions continue to be heightened, hopefully it won't get worse, but it, to the extent that it continues to be this level of tension between the countries, I do believe it, it merits the skill of lawyers and advise, trusted advisors to try to diffuse those tensions by doing so, which allowing the business communications and dialogue to be prolonged and to try to find out-of-the-box solutions to get out of litigation or stay out of the court system. The court system is slow. Arbitration is often slow and expensive now. It's not as quick as we hope or that it should be these days. I mean, there's a backlog in cases. There's a lack of judges. There's a lack of resources. So why not control the situation and dialogue and direction, especially when you know, let's say you as an advisor know what the business objectives are. I oftentimes work with C-suite level executives, if not the CEO or chairman directly. What are your objectives? What would you like to see out of this dispute? Do you want to get out of it? Do you want to settle? Do you want to move on? And most times they say, I just want to get it over with. I have other business opportunities in the horizon. I don't want this to get in the way. I want my reputation to be untarnished. I don't want to be embroiled in litigation. That's public information. Oftentimes that could be aired out and there's a PR concern. And when you hear those things, then how are you going to help them navigate and advise them accordingly? You take those pieces of the goals that they've articulated and fashion a remedy for them. And for me, it's continuing the, the business to business dialogue. I think it should be our role as advisors to help them navigate through difficult situations as best we can. Now, sometimes there's going to be legal arguments that we need to make, but for the most time, for the most part on the business side, it's about money. It's about opportunities that might be lost or miscommunication and dialogue. That's the type of things that we need to do to help the companies move their businesses forward. So you spoke about coming in and assisting a client to understand their goals on a dispute resolution. Could I ask you to maybe take that dispute resolution hat off and put on the hat of the trusted advisor who would talk to a company who's considering an investment in China or some other large economic relationship with a Chinese company, do they, can you help them understand the risks and perhaps put in a risk mitigation strategy, if I can use that phrase? Yeah. So now we're flipping to the other side. This is precisely what I do, Tom, is I can represent the Chinese company interests um, coming into the United States. I can also do the flip, which is a U.S. company who is entering into a rather significant business deal or contemplating a business venture, maybe a partnership with a Chinese company, whether it's a large private or state owned agency. Definitely. Those are the types of advice on a pre-litigation risk assessment in, in, in that context. I do advise uh, U.S. companies how to deal culturally with um, Chinese entities. Um, what might be the most um, difficult hurdles? Um, in my experience, contract negotiations are a kind of a starting point. Sometimes Ch Chinese entities, the way that they approach contract negotiations may be very different culturally from the way we do. We would look at the black letter of the contract and it says what it says. Sometimes Chinese companies look at that and say, well, that means that we can negotiate further down the line. And at the outset, we want to 
have expectations set. Say, look, this is a contract. We expect you to buy by the contract. If there are terms in here that are not sufficiently favorable or you, you want to discuss, we should do this now because once signed, this is a document that will be binding and will be enforceable. So we have those discussions more upfront to eliminate surprise later or disasters later. So we're trying to avert disasters. But yes, I would be advising the clients on any cultural sensitivities, the way that they're negotiating. And maybe I pick up on certain nuances in the business dialogue and helping them understand better how to interpret the other side's responses to contract negotiations. Those are the types of uh, advice and counseling that I would provide to a U.S. company. Unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode, but I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to visit with me, and I hope we can continue this conversation. Thank you for having me, Tom.
This is Tom Fox again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the award-winning All Things Investigation. We've linked to the Hughes Hubbard website in our show notes. If you've enjoyed this episode, I hope you'll subscribe, rate, and review wherever great podcasts are listened to. I hope you will join us again for our next episode of All Things Investigations. All Things Investigations is a special production of the Compliance Podcast Network.